You're listening to the Am Writing Fantasy Podcast. In today's publishing landscape, you can reach fans all over the world. Query letters are a thing of the past. You don't even need a literary agent. There is nothing standing in the way of making a living from writing. Join two best-selling authors who have self-published more than 20 books between them. Now, on to the show with your hosts, Autumn Burt and Jasper Schmidt. Hello, I am Jesper. And I'm Autumn. This is episode 46 of the Am Writing Fantasy Podcast, and today we'll be talking about formatting of ebooks. So, what do you need to consider about formatting? Can you do it yourself? And what about the reading experience? So, that's some of the stuff that we're going to talk about. But, how's your week been? autumn before we get into all of that (laughs) it's been kind of a crazy week here in maine and new england where i'm at we had a huge nor'easter sweep through which it's a big storm that um swept all the way up the coast from pennsylvania up into where i'm at in maine right on the coast and it left a swath of areas without power which was surprising we get these a lot in the winter but this one was just rain and 60 mile per hour winds it tore up trees. And so where I'm at here in Maine, we we lost power for probably a full day and internet as well, of course. So that kind of, you know, oh, no. it was a perfect day for reading a book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> But that's about what you get. Uh, but there are still places here on the peninsula that are without power. And I mean, huge old oak trees and pines with big white pines that you couldn't even put your arms around that are still across power lines. It's just amazing. And it's it's interesting because my in-laws actually where we're staying at the moment have a generator. So for us, and we have cell phones and we're, you know, we're used to traveling. We're used to like, okay, just get in the camper. We have battery backups, two, actually three mm-hmm. solar panels. Um, we use our cell phones as hotspots. The towers were fine. So we're like, oh, it's a normal day. And it wasn't until we got out of the house and we see all these restaurants and cafes and everything is packed to the gills we're like oh people don't have power (laughs) it's it's really funny because i mean we've lived um adam and i have lived just we've our old house was 100 percent off grid so we'd have that all the time we'd go i'd go to work and people are like oh man we lost power did you lose power i'm like nope the solar panels are still working great (laughs) and (laughs) never had a problem and even that we had an old house one of our We've had a few houses in our life and marriage, and one of them was a 200-year-old chestnut timber framed Cape Cod style house. So it was very old and historic, and it was it looked like a little Norman Rockwell painting, and it was beautiful. And even though there we didn't have solar panels or a generator, we whenever we lost power, we had this candelabra that actually had real candles. And so we would go and light the candles and we would, you know, we'd sit there and play cards or something with each other. And it, people would drive by thinking we were fine and had power and it just never phased us. So it's never been a big deal for us, but it was, um, it is interesting when you see how many people, especially in today's day and age and when the internet goes out and you can't charge your cell phone, how many people were kind of freaking out by day two. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I would be freaking out, but I would certainly be annoyed, you know, uh, uh, where every summer or not every summer, but almost every summer when, when we go to Finland uh, for, for to stay at the summer cottages, mm-hmm. we usually rent one. And uh, in the earlier years, like years back then, because in Finland, it's, it's all, Finland is also a huge country. So a lot of the times the summer cottages are like out in nowhere mm. and it's very difficult to get power lines and everything out there. So many times you do have cottages where maybe there's no like, a, you know, proper toilet. Uh, sometimes it, the house is powered by solar cells as well, which you, works fine. But but in the first couple of years when we went there, sometimes we rented those types of cottages. And I always, like, after, like, four or five days, I almost <laughs> had enough. <laughs> it's like, I need my running water. I need my bath. I need a proper toilet. I need the internet. And this is driving me crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in the later years, we've only only rent, like, the lux- luxury cottages <laughs> where they have everything available. Otherwise, I'm not going yet. <laughs> you would have appreciated our old house. I remember when we were telling my parents that we were building this. I mean, we, we literally built it ourselves. We used my old jeep wrangler as the generator it was so far off grid so to run the sols we were using a a car engine because we had nothing else up there 
And so, right. but when you walked in, you flipped on a switch, you used the sink. We had that thing so set up that you would not know what was under the hood was solar power and a different, uh, it was a special pump that was off of an RV. So it was a low draw and wattage. And I feel like we really, we could make this a like, we could sell this to people, like how to do it. We had it so well set up and I'm still kind of proud of that. But yeah, we had a lot of people be like, what's it like? You know, do you not have this and not have that? I'm like, I go home and we watch movies. The stove, you know, I did have a propane fridge and a propane stove, but right. that is totally like, there's actually stores here in Maine because so many people have camps and cabins where there's propane lights, propane stuff. It's just like normal up here. It's so easy and it's kind of cool. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of it is also about getting used to it, yeah. you know. But, but of course, you have to have the willingness to get used to it, which <laughs> I don't. So that's the, my problem. <laughs> so, how what have you been up to this week? That's why you well, had so, the kids were away, so you hopefully you got to see a movie, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, like we like we talked about in last week's episode, uh, the kids were away uh, at my my mother's place for most of the week because they were off school. So. Nice. Uh, the wife and I went to the movies the other day and watched the new Joker movie. <laughs> and uh, it is really, really, really good. Oh, that's awesome. I, the reviews it's, are like mixed, so I wasn't sure if I wanted to go see it, but you say it's good. Uh, yes, it is. It <laughs> is so good. I'm, I'm not going to spoil anything here in case <laughs> for those who have, haven't watched it. But I have to say, you know, because one of the things I was thinking about before going to, mo- to the movies and, and watching this movie was, was some was one of the topics that we as writers so often talk about. And and that's about how to, you know, give the villain justification for his or her actions. Mm -hmm. And I was really thinking about before watching this movie, how are they going to do that with the Joker in the way that, because in my view, if they turn the Joker into like a likable character all of a sudden, then I think that would be an issue because that's not what the Joker is, right? He, He is a bad, bad person. And and I was really thinking, so how are they going to turn him into a likable, or, or not turn him into a likable, likable character rather, but at the same time make it an enjoyable movie? Because obviously, like with books, if you read a book and the main character is like really annoying and you hate the person, <laughs> you usually you don't like the read either. Yes. And that was that was a bit my concern here. Uh-huh. Um, but they uh, they did it so incredibly well, and and like I mean, the Joker, he he is crazy. But yeah. they do a very, very, very good character arc from the start of the movie to the end of the movie where you just see him going more and more and more crazy. Wow. And, and and it makes sense in what happens. And it's it's like it, it is nothing really to do with like, you know, the whole Batman universe or whatever. Mm-hmm. There's very, very little of that. The, the, the whole point of the movie is is the Joker character and how he sort of becomes the Joker and, mm. and how he goes crazy. And it is so well done. Well, there you and go. And I have to say, Joaquin Phoenix, the he deserves oh. an Oscar for that performance. It is incredible acting. He I mean, is it's always, so convincing. That's so good. I mean, he's a good actor anyway, one of my favorites. So yeah, I knew if anyone could pull it off, it would be him. So I guess from a writing perspective, if anyone's working on characters and wants to show a villainous growth, this is a good movie, I guess you're suggesting go see this one. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 especially I like how they how they built on his getting crazy, <laughs> you know how they built one break at a time because it, it's not like some you know some you know well some movies where something happens and then all of a sudden well then the character is completely different all of a sudden I mean and okay sometimes in a movie you can sort of accept that okay that thing happened and that was really traumatizing or whatever and then the person changed Mm -hmm. Uh, i mean yeah you can make that argument but in this movie they just build it brick by brick and it is so convincing it's i really like it i would say (laughs) i think you've convinced me i might have to try to find time in my schedule um of a very busy week i think coming up that maybe i'll have to sneak out and see this one too yeah you should you should and then avoid all the crazy people that comes out as well (laughs) you know i have to say when uh when we watch this movie right so uh, there is a there is a dwarf in the movie okay and um for some weird reason there was these people in the cinema that was laughing like hysterical when something happened to that dwarf. And I'm not going to spoil anything oh. here, but but it, but what happens is not a good thing. You know, it, it's a pretty crazy, insane scene. And they were like laughing hysterical because the, there was this dwarf in the scene. I was like, 
my wife and I was looking at each other like, what the fuck is, isn't this 2019? I mean, <laughs> why is it funny to watch a dwarf anymore? I mean, That's... maybe in the 1980s, I yeah. understand, but Jesus. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Make, might need to take some yeah. like rotten fruit to throw at somebody if they act out of line. Ah, but people are just weird. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've already established that. <laughs> yeah. A week on the internet with the Am Writing Fantasy Podcast. Yeah, so I was actually thinking. Um, normally, we try to to pick out something uh, that is being discussed in the Facebook group or, or on Patreon or something like that. But actually, I was thinking today to maybe just do like a small call to action to our listeners here, if that's cool. That sounds sure. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, because I was thinking after watching the Joker movie here, mm -hmm. um, I was thinking that maybe if people could go into to our Facebook group, uh, you know, if you if if you're not a member already, just search for I am writing fantasy among the groups on Facebook and then you'll find us. But if you go in there and then let us know what you thought of the movie, because I actually would like to hear other people's perspective on this. And if, if they agree with me that it is really a beautiful way to construct the character arc, or if you're having issues with it. And to be honest, I would really like to hear what people think about the last two mo minutes of the movies, but that might be a bit difficult to do without spoiling anything. But yeah, there is a bit there that I really would like to discuss with somebody. Maybe you and I can discuss this once you watch the movie. Uh, Autumn, that but, sounds uh, good. Oh, I like that. So yes, that's a good call to action. So anyone who has seen it, maybe we should put like, you know, asterisks at the top and say spoiler alert in this conversation if you haven't yeah, seen it. Oh yeah, we do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we That's just, a good idea. Yeah, we'll start a thread and see what um who else has seen it and what they think. Because yeah, especially from the character arc point of view and how it progresses, even though I haven't seen it. I like what you said that, you know, this is a good character. Art. I'd like to see what people have to say. And yeah, if we warn them that there's some spoilers ahead, I think people will forgive us. Yeah, we, we could do that. So if you want to, you know, post something in the Facebook group to let me know what you think about the last two minutes, just put that uh, spoiler ahead warning <laughs> at the top there, like Autumn suggesting, and then let me know because I would really like to talk about those last two, <laughs> two minutes there. <laughs> <laughs> and now for those who haven't watched it are really curious to go in and watch the movie because they want to figure out what's what happens in those two minutes so yeah, yeah maybe i just set you up for that maybe that was on purpose maybe <laughs> huh. <laughs> and also by the way uh, if while you're in the facebook group uh, at the point in time when you're listening to this we are in the middle of november uh, of course, uh, Autumn and I record these in advance, but so we are still in October right now, but we're talking to you in the future. So when you're listening, it'll be in the middle of November. And if you're doing NaNoWriMo, then maybe you could just go into the Facebook group as well and let us know how you're progressing in NaNoWriMo. Yeah, that's what I was actually saw that uh, there's been so many posts recently like, hey, are you getting ready? Are you prepping? Yeah, when we're recording this, we're getting close to the end of October. And so everyone is coming together and talking about who's doing it. Why are you in NaNoWriMo? And, you know, what do you get out of it? Do you not? Do you, you know, what is going on? So I love seeing all the people getting excited and prepping for it. And the other ones who are saying, no, this is why I can't do it. Or this is why I don't. Or this is what I do instead. So it's so exciting. But now, you know, when you're listening to this, it'll be November. And I'm sure everyone's going to be supporting everyone and doing word, word count updates and celebrating as people reach their goals. So yay, I can't wait to see that. And on to today's topic. So, Autumn, you suggested uh, some weeks back that we should record an episode about formatting. So, <laughs> so this is <laughs> maybe mine. you should lead us in here. <laughs> Absolutely, well, I think formatting is so important, but I don't see many blog posts, many topics talking about formatting and why it's important. And I know, you know, it's just. Especially, I think when I first started out, you know, back as I like to call 2012 when I was, I was first publishing, that was the Wild West days of self-publishing because a lot of stuff could go, you could do, get away with anything. In fact, Amazon's requirements were only a Word dot .doc file and they would <laughs> do a crazy conversions and make it into an ebook for you. And there were a lot of books out there that you'd be reading it and it would have these weird like hanging line break, something would just stop in the middle of a sentence and it would be like two lines down. <laughs> and I remember reading some of these and even if the story was good, you hit that and you're like, did I miss something? 
what's going on? Where where is the rest of this sentence of this paragraph? Did I get deleted and it throw you out of the story? And I think maybe because I came from that, that we that it's just always been very important to have a very nice looking document, not just because it looks professional, but because as a reader and reading it, you don't want to get hung up going, what is this saying? Where's the rest of the story? Did they paste in somebody else's novel right here? <laughs> and I don't know about you, Jesper, have you had, have you read some books online and stuff that, you know, just the formatting threw you off or even paperbacks? I mean, sometimes things get published and you're like, really? Did anyone check this page? <laughs> Um, I might have to be honest, but but I'm not sure. I can I cannot recall like a specific example. Uh, I, I think nowadays, usually most of the time, the formatting is is under control when you're buying ebooks and stuff like that. So I might have come across something like that, but but I do support your point of view in the way that um, if you spend all that money on getting a good cover, you spend money on on editing and not ignore, ignoring all the time you spent writing the novel in the first place. So it's like not taking care of formatting, then yeah, you're basically stumbling on the finish line and that just makes <laughs> no sense, right? <laughs> exactly. It means so much. And there's, um, you know, well, there's formatters that you can always hire a professional, but there's also a lot of do-it-yourself programs that make it pretty easy. I mean, Scrivener will spit out a file, but to me, I don't actually like Scrivener's file. I don't think it's that pretty or professional looking, but it is possible. No. And if you happen to be a Mac user, Pages actually will spit out an EPUB file and Amazon now takes EPUB files, if you did not know that. So you can mm -hmm. upload directly to Amazon a nice looking EPUB file. So I think it's amazing what is available to make at least a clean looking book, but it's also amazing how many people don't go and download it and check it before hitting publish. And I do think at least taking a few minutes of doing that is important. And I yeah, think yeah, I, I agree. And I, th I think it is also, I mean, at this point in time, we've gotten to a stage where it is so incredibly easy to get good formatting programs. I mean, uh, just like three, four years ago, maybe, mm -hmm. um, I was still using like a, I, I, put, I put a file from Scrivener mm -hmm. and then I was using this Sigil. Sigil, do you know oh, Sigil? Oh yeah, Sigil. I, I've never used it, but I have seen it. Yeah, I was using Sigil because then you could upload the Scrivener file into Sigil and Sigil would allow you to like manipulate the, the headers and everything that Scrivener did not do that well. And uh, and then I could go from there, and, and but it was like there was like four steps to <laughs> to format a, an ebook, whereas nowadays you just like click a button in Vellum almost, right, and then you're good to yes. go, I guess. Yes, and that's what um, I mean. I remember. I think my first one I did do. I I was still on an Apple at the time, but everyone required a Word doc. And I was just like, well, shoot. So I had to go pay for Word, or I think I was transferring it to my husband's Dell, and the crazy manipulations I had to do to upload something. It's like, no wonder it looked like crap. And sometimes it would change the formatting or the uh, fonts. And it was yeah. just a mess to what to create anything. And nowadays I, when Vellum first come at, came out and I knew at that point, I think I'd published at least three or four books and I knew I was serious and I'm very much a do-it-yourselfer. <laughs> so I went ahead and bought Vellum when it was brand new and, fairly cheap and so i've had it since the beginning and oh my goodness one of my favorite thing about it is that it creates a professional really beautiful ebook and paperback now that's across mm. platforms so i can take my vellum file and upload it to like draft to digital or smashwords or the distributors or kobo or anywhere and i know it's going to look it's going to have drop caps. It's going to have these cool center chapters with little like ornaments or an image. And it's going to look like that on every single e-reader from a Nook to an iPad. I love that. I love knowing that I'm yeah. producing something that's quality that the readers are going to be like, hopefully they're not even going to notice the formatting. You spend all this time and effort on it. And the real goal is that the readers don't even notice except for maybe saying, Oh, it's it has a drop cap. It looks so beautiful, or something like that. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But 
but they will notice if it's not there. I oh, think yes. that's the difference. I mean, I they will notice is. if it's crappy, but they will not notice when it looks good because then it just looks like everything else. But that, that's not a bad thing because you, you want to look like everything else. Right. You should not stand out in this way. No, I mean, it's nice to have those little nuances, like having, you know, you can have an image and now with vellum, you can even have like the scene breaks that are within a chapter. You can use... Um, your own emblem or symbol which is really cool so like for my celtic one my one that's a fey novel i have a little um celtic knotwork that i can use as my line break instead of like a you know regular slash and so it's nice having those little touches that can kind of you know keep the theme going in a story but at the same Mm -hmm. time it doesn't have to be it can just be you know a simple line and you know it's there and it's clear and again, the reader, hopefully, it's, it reminds me of last week how when we were talking about dialogue and using the word said, and Stephen King had said, you know, you said because it fades into the background. Well, we both disagree. <laughs> we It's just too boring to only use said. But when it comes to formatting, you do want it to fade into the background. You want it to be, you know, the neat thing about these e-readers uh, versus like a paperback is that you can set up your own colors and fonts things that kind of are how you want to experience books. And I think that's fantastic. So there's this sort of Mm. methodology where you kind of want enough control for the reader to be like, I need a white screen or I want a cream screen. I'm using a Kindle paper white. And so it looks like a real page. You know, that's what I love about vellum. And I'm not trying to sell vellum to anyone, but it has definitely been my favorite thing. And it is, it's not as simple as a click, but it is a drag and drop and then make sure everything looks right. So it's so, and actually Scrivener now will spit it out into vellum basically. So it is just, right, yeah. it's almost seamless and it is fantastic. Of course, you know, I always laugh at that idea that Scrivener will spit out the fi- file into vellum. But the problem is, unless your editor is using either Scrivener or vellum, um you still have to have the editor kind of sitting in there somewhere so you got to figure that one out mm, yeah and, uh, and just to be clear i mean we're not we're not affiliates of willem or anything so no. we're just mentioning it because it's a very good tool and i think i'll put a i'll put a link to willem in the show notes as well just in case anybody wants to check it out but it, again it's not an affiliate link or anything so we're just mentioning it because we really like that tool yeah. and i especially like the uh, because uh, you helped me, Autumn, when I was uh, formatting uh, my book on map making because there was a lot of different uh, images in that file of, of different maps. And I was really concerned initially about h- how is this going to scale on different e-readers because, you know, my file, of course, has like a, a certain uh, size of, of the different maps are, are in, in a set side, size in my Scrivener file. So I was really concerned, like, uh, how is this going to look across the the different e-readers? But then... Uh, yeah, as you just explained, Vellum just uh, auto fits it to the different uh, e-readers, so that it's it's amazing like that. Yeah, it, it looks good no matter where you put it, and you get these like you can do little different images or you know borders around it. It's just it's easy and looks pretty. And there's times um, it's almost I used to format my paperbacks in Word because I had control and I could have different fonts and different drop caps. and I could make it look a little more fantasy. Where you know the font options in Vellum are not all yeah you know, there's like five or six different fonts and honestly they all look about 100 percent the same to me and i love fonts mm. which is kind of sad <laughs> but <laughs> it is true there's not a huge you know, can't really change things really badly and i mean i probably went sometimes too far because i would have my drop cap so that big capital at the beginning of a chapter in a totally different font that maybe looked more fantasy or something i thought the books were just gorgeous because if you're going to pay 11 12 you know plus dollars for a paperback you should get a work of art it should be beautiful and something you're going to cherish because honestly i mean how many books do any of us have that are actually on our shelf so if you're going to go that far it should be just this wonderful wonderful thing to celebrate books and so i would go way out of town and once i switched to vellum paperback i lost a few things that i used to do but i have to admit it is so easy i now format once and i get an epub i get my moby kindle file and i get my paperback boom 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 it doesn't get better than oh that. <laughs> that's why i did it i had to give up some of my creative control but you know, they're also changing and growing and maybe eventually they'll let me add a few more fonts. But <laughs> for now, it's it's not worth um, being that creative because 
really at the end of the day, I just want it to look good and carry across to all the readers wherever they pick it up that it is a beautiful file. And plus it has to not be massive because like we we're talking about with yours and the photos, it's so easy if you're doing that in Word to make that not knowing how things are going to size and there's some coding techniques where it's a flowable text so it's not going to, you know where the page break is going to be for the next chapter if you have one, but basically things don't get hung up on one page versus the next page. There's some really cool things that go into coding for e-readers if you, if you get into coding things. So, you know, knowing all that's in there to create that in Word is cumbersome. And if you have some hidden formatting things like a space or if you're using tabs oh my goodness don't i remember i think the first time i wrote anything i used tabs instead of an automatic indent at a paragraph oh <laughs> that's <laughs> horrible i can't even remember what amazon might have done to it it was just like nope start start over uh those are things that it's really nice when you use a software program it'll fix that for you but I definitely, yeah. I learned very quickly to set up my typing document um, correctly so that you hit enter and it gives you an indent and never, ever, ever touch tab while you're writing something. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, and I think at least at the point of this recording, mm -hmm. uh, Mac uh, or Vellum is only available for Mac. I think you're um, right. But... I, there, is, there should be a workaround. Uh, actually, I'll try to find a link on how to do that workaround mm -hmm. and then put that in the show notes as well if anybody's interested. But what you could do is you can basically do like a Mac in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So that means that you basically have a Mac machine, but it sits in the cloud and then you can do, use the Vellum from there. And then even though you have a PC, you can you can get the files out of Vellum that way. But uh, I'll see if I can find a link to how to get access to a Mac in a cloud somewhere. I'm not, I'm not sure I've never done it myself, but I'll, <laughs> I'll try to find a link and put it in the show notes. But maybe we should also men mention, apart from Vellum, um, if you go to Draft Digital, I'll also put a link to that in the show notes. But if you go there, they actually offer free formatting for you. So they're not going to charge you anything. And you do not have to publish with Draft to Digital either to use the formatting tool. Anybody can use it for absolutely free without any commitments or publishing anything with Draft to Digital. So those guys are just cool like that. So, yeah, they're so, so uh, cool. that's another option. Yes, and it's a pretty powerful editor and formatter, formatter as well. And it'll create something. I don't think it's quite as pretty as Vellum, but it probably is not. No, all the breaks where you need it. Um, it talks, you know, they even step you through what you need for your front matter and your back matter. So if you're just into publishing, maybe this is your first book and you suddenly have to consider, oh, what do I put at the beginning? You know, what do I add? Draft to Digital actually will step you through that and kind of give you some ideas of like, hey, do you have this? Do you have your links here? Do you have this about your bio? So it, they are really good guys that way. And it is you know, is a decent file and it'll carry across very well. And I also want to mention, mm. I am not good with this one, but Calibri is a free formatting software that's available online. And I do have that on I my computer. I tried it once. Yeah. I use it to look at things and it actually converts file types very well. It so if, so you have, <laughs> for if you had for some reason something you wanted to convert an EPUB back to a doc file you can actually do that with calibri and that's why i have it because i can i can change formats around but yeah you mess up in calibri and you get oh, i hate it oh you get spaces <laughs> it's yeah i it blows up whenever i use it but i do i've i know people who have used it and they create amazing books and i do think there's a way of using it for videos which um it's a nonfiction book. Like if you're doing like a web tutorial and you actually want the video embedded in your book, I'm not sure Vellum does that yet, but I think you mm. can do it with Calibri. If you happen to be a coding wizard, <laughs> as much as I play with code and stuff like that, that is way beyond me. Yeah. But another nice trick that I could also mention is that if, if you get, 
I mean, of course, these softwares that we're talking about now, like Vellum or draft to digital that they'll like spit out the format files you need. But but just a, a very neat trick as well is if you have the Kindle previewer so that you can download that from Amazon, it's just like a free piece of software you can download. So not not the Kindle for PC, but the Kindle previewer. If you download that, and basically, you can then use that previewer to open an EPUB file, and then the previewer will recognize that this is not my correct file format, and then it'll automatically convert it into a Mobi. Yeah, so that's pretty. Uh, that's a pretty neat trick. That is a good one, and I do know. I think Book Funnel. If you have to be using Book Funnel, they will now do some conversions for you as well. I think they'll take an EPUB and make it to a Mobi. Um, it's a new announcement, and I don't know if I read the whole thing, but I think that's something that they're doing. So if you're an author and you want to, I mean, why is this important? Because you you can actually upload an EPUB file to Amazon, and they accept it, and it's fine. And even I use Smashwords as my distributor, and instead of doing a .doc file like they require and having it go through the meat grinder and not feeling confident at all about what's going to come out the other end. I actually just upload my Vellum EPUB and they're fine with that as well now, which is exciting. Mm. When they switched to that, I could have just hugged everyone at Smashwords because that was a dream come true for me that I never have to do the meat grinder again. (laughs) (laughs) It's fantastic. But the reason you might want these files if you are trying to send out to beta readers or ARC readers and you need to get the file out before it's available for sale, you kind of need all of these files. So that's why we're like telling you how to go ahead and get them and create them for yourself, not necessarily so that you uploading them, which is, it's great to have them for uploading, but if you need to get them to readers so that they can read it for you and look at things and test out your formatting, (laughs) this is how you can do it. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, even for uploading when you're publishing, I mean, I, I would really advise against uploading a Word file. I mean, yes, it's possible, but it's going to be crap. <laughs> and and the formatting, like we just talked about here, it's important that the reader gets a good experience. So uh, in most cases nowadays, because of these, uh, both the free tools uh, that we've been mentioning or Vellum or whatever you want to do, um, it is not too complicated to do. But But even if you do feel it's too complicated, Paying somebody to do a a conversion for you, I mean, you can even ask Autumn and she will do it. I mean, it's it's not it's not that expensive to get somebody to do it because it's it's a, such a fairly simple job nowadays that you can get somebody to do it fairly cheaply. I would say. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's definitely there's some higher end ones, but always be conscious too of the fact that if you don't do it yourself or you hire someone, you know, make sure they keep the file or give you access to the file because if you one of your readers finds a misspelling and you want it fixed you don't want to have to pay for the formatting all over again you know, no true yeah so that's why i think i like being in charge of it myself i don't think it's just that i'm like a control freak but hey <laughs> whatever i have to tell myself at the end of the day right <laughs> sure <laughs> whatever you say <laughs> <laughs> but it is i would say yeah just sort of final note formatting i think one of the things we really haven't talked about and was one of the first things with formatting that surprised me was so important and will actually decrease um amazon's acceptance of your book is if you do not have that clickable table of contents in the beginning so often if you're uploading a word file unless you've gone through and done the bookmarks even in pages there's a whole bunch of processing and coding you have to do on yourself and it's not too difficult it just takes time and consistency and double checking yourself but making that so you have an active table of contents in the beginning that you click on chapter 11 and actually go to chapter 11 if you don't have that amazon will actually ping that against you so make sure that is there and if you're a new author and you don't know how to do that it's part of your formatting get someone to do it for you or vellum or there's pages in Word, there's a few ways of doing it, and there's a wrong way of doing it as well that it creates something that's not actually going to upload to Amazon. So double check that, but that's one of the biggest things that you want to make sure you have because it's actually important to the places you're uploading. If they don't see that clickable table of contents, they're like, yeah, you don't know what you're doing, and this is not going to work for us. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I hope you got a lot, a lot out of that and uh, learned a bit about uh, formatting and, and some things to think about. Uh, it, it's certainly one of the things you don't want to skimp on uh, at the end and, and stumble on that finish line that there's no reason to do so. And if you find all the techie stuff a bit complicated, you know, uh, email us. Yeah. You can, stop by. <laughs> yeah. You you can commission Autumn to uh, to do it for for you for um, um, and for a very fair price she she will do that but that's up to you whatever you want to do uh, I'll put some uh, I'll put some links in the show notes as I've been mentioning here and uh, and then uh, next Monday I'm aiming to have an interview lined up for you but I'll see how that goes uh, and if for some reason that doesn't work out Autumn and I will be back. If you like what you just heard, there's a few things you can do to support the Am Writing Fantasy Podcast. Please tell a fellow author about the show and visit us at Apple Podcast and leave a rating and review. You can also join Autumn and Jasper on Patreon.com slash Am Writing Fantasy. For as little as a dollar a month, you'll get awesome rewards and keep the Am Writing Fantasy Podcast going. Stay safe out there and see you next Monday.